Welcome back to another great episode of Eggs. Today, our guest is Chris Raybold. Chris is the front of house audio engineer for artists like Bruno Mars, Kenny Chesney, Beyonce, Lady Gaga, and many, many more. I am super excited for this conversation. So without any further delay, please welcome our guest, Chris Raybold. Chris, how are you doing? Good, man. How are you guys? Not doing well, bad. Chris. Yeah, really, uh, really looking forward to this conversation. It should be uh, yeah. a, a good one. Yeah, thanks for having yeah, me. It, and uh, I'm coming off of a, a long travel day and uh, sitting outside a friend's house in, in Chelan, Washington. So I'm back stateside, and I really appreciate you kind of making time and getting our schedules aligned. So thank you yeah. so much. Yeah, this is perfect. Yeah, yeah no, we're um, not really good. Mike's been in Nome for the last six weeks in Nome, Alaska. And so, so accomplishing this show over those great distances has been, uh, has been difficult. So I'm uh, yeah. grateful to have him back. God, yeah. That's funny. So, uh, Chris, let's let's just jump into it. How how long have you been doing audio, and how did you get your sea legs? Somehow, the answer to that question is twenty five years. Now, I had to put it down on something yesterday, and I was like, God, just looking at it, you know. <laughs> um, I don't know how. I was telling a friend the other day. I was like, suddenly, young Chris is no longer young Chris, and because uh, <laughs> I was the kid forever. I started when I was nineteen you know? Okay. And, uh, it seemed like forever I was going to be the kid. Um, and b basically how it started was, so I live here in Athens, Georgia and i came here out of high school. Um, I thought I was going to play college football and I got hurt and, um, it was apparent that I could still play college football, but not at the level that I was thinking I was going to. And I, so I came here to Georgia with some friends just because I'd always been into Athens and I was into the music scene and just, you know, whatever. Getting, getting into Georgia is now apparently infinitely harder than it was when I did it <laughs> 25 years ago. But um, anyway, so I came here and um, I went to school for about a quarter. They were on the quarter system then. And at the end of that, I had gone to like a really uh, tough private school academically. And I was like, you know, man, I've jumped through all these hoops. I've done all this stuff. You know, I'm taking English 101. I'm taking Spanish. I'm taking what? I don't even know if those are classes, but you know what I'm saying? And I'm like, oh, yeah. what am I doing? What am I doing? And, um, and I was sitting on my couch, this orange couch I had bought. And uh, <laughs> I remember it very, very well. And I literally sat on that orange couch and looked at the ground. I was like, if I'm going to be in this world, what, what's going to make me happy? What do I want to do? And I literally just made a decision like right then and there. And now that's very storybook and everything. Now, mind you, that began the trudge, you know, through the muck and everything else to get there. But that was the moment. I just said, what am I going to do to be happy in this world? And I said, I want to be, oh, you know what? I want to be, a, I want to be a mixer because I could kind of play the guitar. I could bang around on the drums, kind of play the keys. Not really. I just knew, you know, my stepdad taught me some songs and I knew I didn't want to write and I didn't want to perform. But I had always been interested. I would love concerts. The concert experience always spoke to me. And that was like church for me. You know, it's just, yeah. and I was always so curious why it would sound one way one day and one day at another show. And the notion of putting all the pieces together of anything appealed to me. And I just said, you know what? I want to be a mixer. And then I guess I kind of said it right there. I mentioned shows. Most people, their, their story of how they got into particularly live audio is they were like a studio mixer and then they're, or they were they're in a band and no one else would run sound and they started doing I knew from the jump that I wanted to do live concert audio and I just made up my mind and so what happened was I said you know what I don't want to go to school next quarter I'm going to take some time off I've been working at a place called Rocky's Pizza <laughs> I'd saved up enough money that I was going to go run around I was going to see, see my favorite band my band <clears throat> favorite band at that time was this band called Widespread Panic who was out of Athens so I had some mutual friends that worked for him and we're one and basically one night at one show they were like hey will you help me load the no will you help me sell t-shirts will you help me watch the merch booth and i was like yeah sure and then i helped them like load the truck they had one semi truck at that time which to me was just like you know it was monsters of rock it was the biggest thing i'd ever seen before you know it was like god look at this and um man i just started helping them out and it grew from there and those were like the humble, humble beginnings. And I stayed with them for a little less than a year. It's just like kid roadie, stocking coolers full of beer, selling t-shirts, 
breaking the stage, literally whatever they wanted. I mean, and I was, I just, and I was in heaven. I absolutely loved it. So I stayed there for a while. And then I told him I was going to, I was like, guys, I'm going to go up to Nashville and I'm going to go get serious about audio. I'm going to go to school. Uh, and I did that. And then long story short, they ended up calling me four or five years later to come back in a much more larger real capacity. And that began my professional career, you know, and it came full circle. I came back there to Athens and, and that became, and, and from there we can talk about it. It, it did a number of things on its way up, but that was kind of the, that was, that was the beginning. Well, I, I love that it's the, the humble beginning of, you know, stocking the, the beer cooler and doing merch and all the other stuff. Ryan has a very similar experience. Well, yeah, I, I was going to say, though, he went right to the guys with the semi trucks. I was still unloading the little four by eight trailers and stuff like that. Well, and it's funny. Semi truck. <laughs> yeah, well, it's funny because what I did was that was my initial foray into it. And then I went, guys, you know what? <clears throat> I need to go. Let me go to ground ground zero and start and then so i went to school i learned i got the theory i did all the bars all the clubs all the weddings all the frats i mean you name it so i went to to that i basically went like no nah, this isn't real let me get real and start <laughs> from real and then came back up and met them again yeah you know? so that's awesome yeah in my experience yeah. i was always on the management side so i did the tour managing and stuff like that i didn't have any uh I didn't have any skills in this way. I was just, a, I ran or, or was in the very beginnings of building an advertising design agency at the time. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I started out doing concert posters. So most of these guys yeah. would just let me hang around cause I was doing the posters. And, uh, and so, and then I just evolved into like a management role. So I ended up, I spent a few years on the road touring with different bands and stuff, but, um, so, but your story really resonates with me. I love that stuff. Also, I love widespread red panic. So that's awesome. I love uh, that. Funny. Was those guys. So yeah, uh, that's cool. And there must be something about Georgia, man. We've met a lot of musicians, a lot of talented folks in, in, in Georgia lately. So I, I don't know what that is. But I, I've, I've often said, you know, there. that there's definitely something in the water here. Like Georgia, as is most of the South, is a weird place, you know, and art and weird go hand in hand. So <laughs> particularly Athens, particularly this place. So uh, what college did you go to and why did you pick that one over another one? I went to, so I went to Middle Tennessee State University <clears throat> and I went to MTSU because they had, it was an actual, now I say all this and I never graduated. I ended up a semester short and I got a call. Right here, right here. Yeah. <laughs> right, that's yeah, like, totally. sums me up. <laughs> well, that's the whole thing is like you call and you get a job or you get a gig and it's like, well, that's why I went to school in the first place. So um, I went to MTSU because it was, and there's certainly nothing wrong with, uh, you know, certificate programs, shortened, you know, particularly nowadays, sort of fast track programs. But I wanted to go to an established four year university and they had the, the oldest, it was the recording industry program. It was the oldest of its kind, uh, is the oldest of its kind in the United States. And plus it's near Nashville, yeah. which is where I grew up. Uh, I love Nashville. I love the area. It just, everything about it kind of made sense. And I got to be honest with you, I didn't love, you know, it's in Murfreesboro, which is outside of Nashville. I didn't love, like I went there to get work done, you know? I mean, mind you, I partied like anyone, but like I went with a purpose, you sure. know, and the purpose was to get better at this thing. And I did that. Um, the, the truth of the matter is I would spend a lot of time, I'd go to class, I'd start a semester, I'd go to class, I'd be doing great, my grades were great, but then I'd get some new gig at some new club or some new, some new band and then I'd drop out because the gigs were always more appealing to me than the school. You know, that being said, the theory and everything I got from the school was invaluable and I'm grateful for it, but I didn't particularly love the school, I didn't love Murfreesboro, I loved the gigs in Nashville. That's what I loved. But well, and, and it's interesting the school too. provide a Oh, go ahead, Mike. Oh, uh, I was just going to ask, the school provided a, a live audio format or was it mainly recording and you had to kind of- It was, it was studio the focused. Way. They did have, they had, um, it wasn't a class, but you could like help out. You know, there was like a campus PA and they would do shows and this and that. And the guy was great. He was awesome who ran it. I always really liked him, but I, I never, I just, I think I didn't find out about it till late. I was already kind of starting my own little work circles and- in the clubs in Murfreesboro and Nashville and stuff. And so I just, I never did anything with it. So everything I did in school was studio focused. Okay. 
Yeah, yeah. no. So uh, what, what, what I was going to say that I think is kind of interesting about your story. And, you know, it's interesting because I'm basically the same kind of deal with college as is Mike. We both, uh, you know, started and, and never finished. And in my case, uh, I, I came through like an advertising and marketing program. I'd always uh-huh. been sort of artistic. And so I, I came out of school and, you know, basically I started a business doing art and graphic design. And that's way more fun than going to school for it. Totally. So, uh, so I just, you know, I did basically the same thing. But one thing I think is really interesting about sort of, you know, the what you're describing and sort of the life of uh, somebody working on tour, for example, and sort of, you know, sort of, I guess, my creative experience as well is that people like us seem to have sort of this mindset where we really like to start, do, then finish. Mm -hmm. So like, you know, school, for example, is kind of a long slog, right? It takes some time to get through there and everything. But like when it comes to like a concert, for example, you like show up for work, you do everything, you perform the event, and then you walk away, right? Like, I mean, it's all kind of done in one evening. Yes. And it's sort of the same for me in terms of, you know, projects, like if we're doing a design job or something, maybe it takes multiple days or whatever, but ultimately it's kind of a, you know, beginning, middle, end. And then Mm -hmm. we're on to the next thing. And I think there's sort of something about just sort of, you know, different people's personalities that that really lends to this. So it's cool that you were able to identify this kind of behavior pattern, kind of, I guess, in your own life and, you know, really apply it into something that brought you. Yeah. And and not to put a a bummer twist on it, but just a real twist. That's, (laughs) that's part of the struggle with COVID among the myriad of struggles that are (laughs) part of COVID is, Exactly what you just said. You know, I come from and went to on purpose a place of not instant gratification, but, you know, sort of, at least once the tour starts, you know, for the, you know, you listeners that aren't familiar, you know, there's, there's oftentimes, at least with the acts that I'm fortunate enough to work with, there's a large bit of rehearsal time. So you're building this thing for months and months and months before it goes. But even that has you know, you hit your marks daily and you see progress, you know, and touring is very much, there are just little points during the day. They're like, this happens then, this happens then, this happens then. The doors, whether I'm ready or not, are opening at six o'clock, the crowd's coming in, show starts at eight, show's over at 11. We did it, boom, high five. Everybody put all this stuff back in the trucks. Here we go, let's go do it again. And now, you know, it's that, that is just the complete opposite. It's like, oh, this is what normal people do. We'll have to wash the dishes again. <laughs> well, it's so true. I mean, it's you know? one of the things that I've really noticed through COVID is that, you know, there's so much fear. There's so much other stuff going on right now. But I think ultimately what it boils down to is this like lack of certainty, right? Yes. And when you're on the road or if you're a creative professional or you're doing anything like this where you have sort of that beginning, middle and end, life mm-hmm. is pretty predictable, right? Like mm-hmm. like you said, doors are at six, crowd shows at eight. We're done by 11, 1130. We're, we're on to the next city. And, you know, but it's very finite. It's very figured out. There's not not a lot of room for, you know, uncertainty Mm -hmm. where right now amid COVID, you know, for people, you know, not only in our industries who are are being hit pretty hard, but, you know, for just human beings in general, I think we're all sort of struggling with this lack of certainty. You know, we just we don't know when does it end? When does it whatever, you know, and we're looking for answers, but they're just not clear. No, Yeah. yeah, it's that lack of a finish line. You know, that's the big one. Aside from beginning, middle, and end, it's like, what is, what, where's the end? Where yeah, are we going? When are we done yeah. with this? Yeah. When are we so, done? And, and you know? since you brought it up, let's, let's kind of go down this road. Uh, Ken Pooch, who we've had on the show as well, uh, recently posted a photograph of uh, the Iron Maiden team. Mm-hmm. And there's probably 150 people in the picture. And he's saying every single one of these people right now are unemployed and probably will be unemployed until mm-hmm. next year. How has COVID been for you? Have you had any work or are you just doing podcasts with Ken the whole time? (laughs) You know what I mean? Well, it's funny, you know, when, um, when, um, when you were talking, Ryan, I was thinking, yeah, I was joking with someone the other day. I was like, God, you know, what really stresses me out? I'm like the calendar, the count, my calendar and my phone. I'm like, it's just thing after thing, after thing, after thing. When in all reality, I've, that's all I've ever known is thing after thing, after thing. However, if I look at my calendar, if I even look at it, all it says is Detroit, you know what I'm saying? And that's far more palatable than 500 calls. And so basically how it's been for me, I'll be honest with you. So I'm fortunate. I have a client that is providing, it is, there is something coming in monthly. You know what I mean? There is, yeah, oh, I'm beyond grateful. It is a tiny, 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 tiny amount compared to what it usually was, but there's a thing coming in. Other than that, it's just hustle all day long. 
all day long trying to figure out how to make a buck. And so I've gotten involved in everything from, you know, there's a, <clears throat> it's so funny. I'm used to going across the planet to go to work. There's a church two miles from me that I'll go in that I had consulted for, you know, it's like nowadays churches, a lot of times have very real sound systems and stuff. Yeah, it's so surprising. It, right. And sometimes like unbelievably, it would make sense, you know, it's church money, you know? Yeah. And so uh, these guys, I had consulted with them and I really liked the guy that ran it. Anyway, I'm there every Sunday now, every Sunday that I can be, I'm doing that. <clears throat> Pooch and I have got our thing. And of course we have our sights set on something more than just us yapping, you know? Um, and we're working on that. In fact, that reminds me, I need to make a call. Um, <laughs> I have had a few, I just went and did a broadcast thing in Nashville two weeks ago. I've got a consulting thing that's going to take me out of town in a couple weeks. So it's unbelievable. For the most part, though, man, I'm just hanging out trying to figure out how to make it happen. Yeah. You know well, what I mean? And, and well, and like Mike was saying about Pooch's photo of like the, the maiden crew, that's not even mm -hmm. factoring in, you know, the 200 people in every city. Who oh, are the, that's a, the contract guys who come in and work security yeah. or handle catering or, or whatever. Right. And so, I mean, you know, you're talking, I mean, you might be three, 400 people by the time it's all Absolutely. done. And those are people who, you know, basically rely on Maiden to come through tonight and, and Metallica tomorrow. And, you know, I yeah. mean, they need the, the whole thing going all the time. And, and so to have that whole ecosystem shut down is really unfortunate. And for a lot of those guys that are just sort of gig workers, you know, I mean, they can't take, you know, catering concert events to online. You know what I mean? Like right. You, well, <clears> and that's a digital the funny, solution. Yeah. I started to say it's the funny thing, but that's the rub is a lot of people, you know, in the live event world, we don't lose our job. We lost our industry. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Now, 100%. That, and that being said, I am fortunate in that all the things I just mentioned to you are things related to my skill set, my ability to to do the things that I've always done. And I may, I'm able at least up till now, knock on wood to piece it together with that skill set. The real answer is, Hey man, this is our great depression. Get out there and go work at Lowe's, get out there and go like, just do get through it because this is not forever. That's the answer. So I'm really lucky that I've been able to piece it together and still do things where, you know, it's still what I do. You yeah. know, the, the reason I just flew in from Nome is I was up, there doing construction absolutely like I, man. I was leveling homes because you know i'm a nightclub dj and all the mm -hmm. nightclubs are shut down and so, hell yeah and you know <laughs> what man i think for like and honestly that's an amazing story covid oh yeah i went to nome alaska for six <laughs> weeks in bulldozed houses like that's cool that's yeah. that's cool can we cur curse on this one that's cool yeah shit. yeah yeah totally yeah, yeah that's that's cool shit you <laughs> yeah. know like that's a story to tell your kids or whoever like hey man i did whatever it took to yeah. get through and guess what it ended and guess what well, i'm doing now i'm djing in clubs well you know and that's I mean? the thing is i think that that's a really positive outlook right i think right now there's so many people who are sort of devastated and i think it's you know i think it really illustrates the grandiosity of the whole thing the way you phrased it this idea mm -hmm. that you've lost not just a job but an industry mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, and theoretically, we'll get back to some, I mean, I don't know if it'll be whatever we would have considered normal, but there will certainly be touring concerts again in the future one day. And, uh, and so, but I also think that there's a lot of opportunity now, you know, as bad as things are for innovation and for new things. And so are you seeing anything in your industry in particular that's come out that's been cool or interesting, maybe people taking to online uh, you know, the delivery mechanisms of, of audio experiences and things like that through the internet that are, are you know, have, have been particularly innovative? Yeah, you know, obviously I'm not jumping to be like, yes, absolutely. Blah, blah, blah. I'm, I'm seeing what is predictable. You know what I mean? Like I'm seeing people go, well, we can't get together. We can't do shows. <clears throat> Let's, you know, we've got what we have, which is we can stream you know, the, 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 the drive-in approach is novel. I think what I'm seeing is just people doing their best, but none of it, at least to date, it's just kind of like, yeah, of course you're doing that because we got to do something. And that's yeah. really the only avenue we have left to do it, you know, in, in, in this moment, in this time. And I, and I will say this, I believe this, you know, we're seeing so many things like, look at us, you know, we're on a Zoom call right now. I think we're seeing a lot of things changing that will continue down this route of change because you know a lot of and this is unfortunate or fortunate depending on which side of the fence you're on but you know a lot of brick and mortars are finding they don't need to be open they can do this you know what i mean um 
So, but that is, again, that's going to be a money decision that dictates that. I do feel, I, I do feel that our industry comes back and that's not from some sort of Pollyanna overly op optimistic, gosh, I hope so thinking. I really do. Because when people talk about normal, the new normal, the old normal, normal for human beings ultimately is to get together to commune and to have a good time. And that can only happen one way by doing that. And I yeah. do feel once the company, this is the huge if, once that, once the comfort factor is there, we, we, we're all forgetting how, just how short our attention spans are and how quickly we, we do have the ability to move on. So I do feel, is it tomorrow? Absolutely not. It's going to be a while. It's yeah. going to be a minute. Go level more houses. But, <laughs> but I do think it comes back. I, I really, I think in the exact same way we know it and have it, I think we are, we have the shortest attention spans and we're so stuck in whatever is in front of us now that the new now people have convinced themselves is the new, you know, that's the whole new normal. And I just, yeah. I don't, I don't think that, I don't think anyone's enjoying this. No, I think, I well, think we are, so, we are going to move on as soon as we are able to. Yeah. And know? I think that that's one of the things, you know, you hear so many people talking about, you know, the future of things or the new normals and stuff. And I keep trying to reset or sort of frame things in my mind that, you know, basically normal is just what we're given on any given day. There is no exactly. new normal coming, you know, no. back to this idea of a finish line, right? Like, I mean, we're mm -hmm. not going to be at new normal. You know, mm -hmm. some might argue it comes right after the election, but until then, right. Yeah, um, it just disappears you know, in November, right? But, um, I wish that were the case. That'd be great. Yeah, that, would, that would sure make life easier, huh? Uh -huh. But um, so, but I do think that, you know, it's, uh, I mean, you know, with certainty, we will try and get back to, to whatever we can get back to. And especially, you know, in and around these experiences that are, I mean, they just require human interaction. Like we just have to be with each other, you know, especially yes. in concerts. And, you know, mm -hmm. I know Mike and, and my experiences, you know, mirror yours where, I mean, going to concerts and stuff is a really big deal for us. In fact, Mike and I mm -hmm. met through a concert. I was touring with the band and he was mm -hmm. providing gear for one. And so we, uh, you know, have a very similar path in that way. And, you know, so to have lost live music is a really big deal for all of us, I think, not right. just, you know, because of the trade, but just sort of the mm -hmm. emotional well-being. you know, the human. Yeah. 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 I have an inter a, a, a sort of this little anecdote <clears throat> from the gig I did a couple of weeks ago. It was the first time I had, you know, I'd mixed at home. I've done stuff at the church. I've done little stuff, but it was the first time it was, it was a larger scale gig in the check-in process in COVID. And I was like, I had known intellectually what it was going to look like, but I haven't had, hadn't had to go through it yet. And now, mind you, at this one, we weren't tested daily, but it was an extensive check-in process. You had to fill paperwork out, you know, of course, online. Every night, there was just, it, was, it was a pain in the butt. But it was, it was done right, and, it, and it's what it should have been. And, um, you know, that is a giant expense for them to have to do that. And again, this whole world, as we know, is it's just, it's things all about, it runs on what the bottom dollar is. As soon as they don't have to do that anymore, that is no longer the new normal. You know what I mean? Because <laughs> that is a giant expense and a giant hassle. And as soon as the comfort factor and the safety is there, those things will, you know, so that is the now normal. That's, that's what I wish people would focus on more. You know, I mean, plus when you start predicting the new normal is like, well, did you see this coming? <laughs> you know, <laughs> Nostradamus. Yeah, where were you, you on this one? <laughs> where were you on this one? Right. <laughs> so anyway, man. But So um, um, yeah. let's, let's get back to your career and, uh, you know, COVID's going on. There's nothing we can do about it, but we can talk about how you got to where you're at. Yeah, now. yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so you're working with Widespread Panic. I heard you mm -hmm. got a, a random phone call saying, hey, Lady Gaga needs an audio guy. You yep. Been? How did that so, go down? Yep. So I'm driving down the road and I get a call and it's from the president of the sound company. You know, when you're with, when you're touring, you have all these different vendors that provide your sound, your lights, et cetera, et cetera. I had been with using this company at this point for probably eight years, had a good relationship with the owner. They knew that I was a good mixer, I'll say you know what I mean? But I was doing a upper mid tier act. I wasn't doing the big, big, big stuff. And as happens in the industry, there was this new, all, all I was told was, Hey, can you get on a plane tomorrow? There's this artist, okay. right? There's this artist. She is, you know, 
she's just fired her old engineer. She's waiting on her new engineer to come in, who is like the second coming of Christ. It's, it's his gig. However, they need someone to fill in this gap. And this is a gigantic gig. We need somebody right away. And so they're calling me more because I knew the gear and I was familiar with working with large acts as far as like the number of musicians and everything, but not because I was a pop mixer. I certainly was not a pop mixer at that time. <laughs> um, and finally, I'm like, well, you know, a lot of times in these situations, they don't want to tell you who it is. It's, it's like you're going to work for the queen or something, you know. And, um, and finally, they told me, they're like, well, it's Lady Gaga, which meant very little to me at the time. I was just aware of the name. I didn't know. I didn't realize I was going to build the startup for the largest tour in the world with the biggest artist in the world, you know? Oh. So, you know, it's like, I tell people, I'm like, when the Yankees call, like you go, you go. And I was like, just, I'll be there. And I did just that, you know, and I was on a plane less than 24 hours later, rolled into New York, rolled into rehearsals. And man, I walked into Mars is what I walked <laughs> into compared to what I had been used to. And um, it was totally different the approach musically, the way things were structured musically, certainly politically were things different. And I, and I did a large, enormous, and it's got to be a common thread on this, uh, on this show, but a lot of faking it, you know, a lot. And, and really, I did that, still do that to this day. It's like, you just kind of, you're like, what are we to do? Okay. You know, and you just keep going. There's no choice. You, you take the gig and you just keep going. And so, and that was it. And it went really well. And I was there for, I can't remember how long. I set up the tour. I got it going. I did right in everyone's eyes, handled myself like a decent human being, and then and walked away from it. And because of the relationship, because of the impression I made with a number of people, uh, both in her camp, from the sound company, some people on the production end of things, a year later, I didn't hear from the production manager, who for guys that don't know, that's kind of like the technical, bo the, the boss on the road. That he, he or she is in charge of putting together the, the whole production, watching over everything. A year later, I'm sitting on the bus. I go, I go back to widespread panic. I go back to life and uh, I get an email from him. He's like, Hey, can you talk? And it turns out that he's going to take over the Beyonce camp. And he wants oh, to wow. know now, mind you, I haven't spoken to him in a year, you know, and that's just the way it works. So again, it was, Riding down the road, somebody called, I pick up the phone, yes, I can, I go, I do it, I do everything I can to do a good job, I, I just let it go, then it comes back, you know, and so it's just that serendipitous sort of continual falling forward thing. Yeah. Um, well, I think that's yeah. a, good, a good point that you make too, this idea, I mean, first of all, being willing to raise your hand, right? I mean, obviously you were given this opportunity because you, you'd proved yourself over, over a series of, you know, years and you had been working on this for some time and built a reputation, you know? So obviously when people call you, I mean, they're calling you for a reason. They're not calling some random dude. They didn't right. call me first. Right. And, uh, you know, so, I mean, so that's, that's great. But then also, you know, this idea, some of it, I mean, we always sort of simplify it to fake it till you make it. Right. But I think the reality is like, that's kind of it. Like, I think the idea that anybody really has everything sort of figured out is probably wrong. Yes. I think for the, for the most part, all of us are kind of winging it and, and maybe by calling it or saying it as fake it till we make it, we're being maybe a little too flippant with it because I think the reality is like, this is how we grow and learn and evolve, you know, but like, having done Lady Gaga, I mean, you're going to show up for Beyonce's camp and it's going to be totally different. Like, I mean, they're both pop singers. They're both, you know, ostensibly using the same mixer or the same, you know, hardware or whatever, but mm. it's still totally new, totally different. And how could you prepare for that? It's like, you know, not to talk too much politics or whatever, but I mean, you know, how can any one person be prepared to be president? You don't know until you're there, you know, right. so how, how could anybody come in and step into Beyonce's <clears throat> role and just know what the expectations are? Right. Yeah. So, I mean, there is a little bit of this kind of rise to the occasion moment. And I think, you know, those who succeed do rise to those moments and mm -hmm. those who, uh, who don't, you know, don't get the call next time. That's right. Yeah. And, and you're right. There is a, you know, there's a sort of a romantic air or a humbleness to, you know, fake it till you make it or, Oh, I was just winging it. But there are times when you truly have no clue what you're doing. And then there are other times when fake it till you make it or winging it means be a perceptive, aware, head on a swivel adult and just roll with it, you know? Yeah. Uh, and I've done both. I've done, we all have, you know, um, early on, I talked about that, those super formative years, you know, one of the things I was a real big proponent of 
was was reading about my hopeful one day craft and my and at that point in time this is in the mid 90s so it's the advent of the internet trade mags were really big and my big thing was i wanted to know the nomenclature i wanted to know all the wordage so that if i ever found myself in a conversation with some of the big boys i at least could say the right words you know and that was the fake it to make fake it till you make it part of my story to the highest degree where I really was just learning what words to say, you know, but even that was like a purposeful, I did that on purpose. You know, I knew that it would, that it would serve me. So it's like, you know, you hear about again, fake it till you make it or, well, you just I found myself in the right situation at the right time. All of that is very real, but you can also kind of will your way there or, you know what I mean? Again, fall forward if you're, trying in the right ways. Um, and I think I have been fortunate, but with a little bit of purpose and all of that too. So um, I, I say that with humility and, and with pride, you know? Yeah, no, I think that's totally fair. And, and I mean, it is a really good point. I mean, you know, you should be able to, and these are the things you always hear from people, right? Chase your dreams, do that, you know, try and live the life you want to live, that kind of thing. So, but mm-hmm. I, I think you make a great point or it's a good observation anyway, that, you know, you do still have to put in the work. You know, if if you do just fake it till you make it, like eventually you'll be discovered. Like eventually you're not going to be able to keep up with the conversation or, you know, something's going to get over your head. And in a highly technical Mm -hmm. industry like yours, like it'd be pretty easy to lose track. So, but, uh, you know, but you did the work, you laid the groundwork and, you know, yeah, you were blessed with some opportunities, but those didn't come, you know, because you were faking it. They came because you were prepared to, to catch the opportunity when it arrived. Right. And as you're faking it, you're learning what you just faked your way through. You know, that's the important thing too. Yeah. Otherwise you're just a fraud. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Can you talk about going into, you know, Lady Gaga camp or Beyonce camp and getting ready for that tour? What's the Mm -hmm. process like? Um, How is it kind of working with the artist in the rehearsal environment versus the first show? Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah, it's a multi- and that too has evolved. It's funny when you ask, I'm like, God, it's been a while now. I don't even remember. Uh, <laughs> it's uh, it, that too is a process that evolves and it looks a little different for each artist. And it really comes down to also like, what kind of lead time do you have? Like I mentioned one of those was, can you get on a plane tomorrow? You know? Yeah. And then other times it's like, Hey, we, we know you free up in six weeks or two months we're starting rehearsals for blah, blah, blah. Would you be interested? You have plenty of time. So if if that's the case, let's say there's some lead time. First thing I do is musically, I I go, what am I getting into? You know, I literally, it's as simple as going to now Apple music or whatever, Spotify, wherever you, whatever you do. And just, what are their hits? You know what I mean? And so, and I just start digesting it. It's just like osmosis. I'm not necessarily breaking the songs down. I just start listening, having it on let it sink into me. Um, then there is an enormous, an enormous amount of prep work, uh, research, like, okay, what is this act look like? How many people are in this thing? What are we doing? How many, I mean, literally down to what, you know, what is he or, he or she, are they using a handheld vocal mic? Do they need six of them? Do they need one? Are they, are there, I mean, every little last, people have to realize every last thing that like, oh, by the way, makes its way onto that stage has to be accounted for, yeah. you know, the, the new drum, the new guitar, the new this. So you just, it's, it's compiling the information. Then all that information has to make it to the, in my case, the sound providers, the, the, the vendors. And I have to spec exactly what gear I want and what I need. So it's just, it's this, it's a very long process of putting the gear together, trying to, it's left brain, right brain stuff, you know, exactly what do I need? How many pieces do I need to build this thing? And then it's okay. But then artistically, what am I, what am I tasked with here? Then there is also this thing that falls in the middle, which is, and this can't be uh, overstated is what's the political climate. You know, I, I say all the time, you know, who matters, who matters in this camp. And it looks different in every single camp. Now they all kind of can mimic one another in certain ways, but you never know in one camp, it might be the artist might be completely checked out. They might be the person that cares the least on the tour. And I mean of everyone, or they're the person that cares the most, or it's mom, mom's around, 
or it's the manager <laughs> or it's the choreographer or it's the musical director or it's, it's just, so you figure out who matters and then, you know, it's then compiling your own team. I guys, I could go on for a long time here. So, you know, you, you get, it's just, it's like, I, I got to hope and think it's like any other endeavor. It's just on a tour there are so many moving parts and because it is quite literally moving, you have to be well accounted for with everything because you can't, you're, you're, you are a moving target. Your everything is just on the, on the go. So you've really got to kind of have, and no matter how much you plan, particularly within the pop world, God, no matter how much you plan, you're still not going to be fully there. It's still going to be coming at you super last minute. Um, you know, incredibly last minute and then and that's when you've really got to be versatile and agile and 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 adapt so you get to pick all the mics you get to pick all the equipment the board you use everything does yeah. I, the art, artist have input on that or is it mainly you it's me but there are circumstances where you know if the artist is always saying into certain a certain microphone or they have some you don't really find this much anymore at all but you know um if someone had an endorsement deal or, you know, something like that. And as far as gear goes, there's very few mandates that have ever been placed on me. It's usually just do whatever you need to do, you know, to, to, to get the job done. So, so by and large, I mean, there are stories of, you know, where people don't have say in things. Now, sometimes picking the sound vendor, the company that gets pretty big, pretty political. Cause that's where, again, it's a money thing. You know, there's a lot of money in that. So people might, again, the production manager, whoever might have a, the artists themselves might have a pre-existing relationship with, um, with a certain company, in which case you go in. And that can be weird because that company, they're going to have like the console you want. They're going to have the microphones. They're going to have all the gear. They might, their speaker system, which is the final bit of, you know, that's where I present to everyone what I'm doing. It, it, so it's pretty damn important. That might not be to my liking. So wow. that can, that can be tough. That can be tough. But, um, but yeah, but, but for the most part, I get to pick most what I want, what I use, you know? Yeah, that's nice. Just the flexibility of being able to say, Hey, this works for, better for this. I like this console. And, and instead yeah. of coming into a kind of like a foreign environment for every artist that you, you work with. Yeah. So, and, and it all looks, it generally looks the same for me. It doesn't matter what genre, like I'm, I'm mentioning pop music, but I do any number of things and I pretty much all, I have, I have my tools that work for me, you know? Okay. So, and I even lay things out. I mean, that's an important thing too. Like on an er ergonomic level, I want it to look and feel literally when I reach my hand X this far, I know what fader is going to be there. If I'm here, I know what's going to be there. It's just, I keep the layout the same. So that it almost mimics as though I'm working in the same studio every day, That's you know, awesome. even yeah. whether it's a jazz or country or pop or rock or whatever, it's wherever you go, there you are, you know? So, so your first kind of 10 years uh, in the industry, were you analog? Was this pre-digital or? Yeah. Yeah. So the first 10 years for sure. In fact, that's about exactly because I started and I say I made that decision on that orange couch in 1995. And I think I took delivery of my first digital console in 2005. Wow. So it, it was a, it was 10 years. I mean, I feel fortunate. I came up, you know, in college. Yes, we were we were we were learning Pro Tools, which I'm pretty sure at that time was called Sound Tools. You know, we were learning digital audio uh, workstation based software, but we were also cutting tape. In consoles, yeah. there were digital consoles, but for the most part, I learned on analog. So I really came over, came at the at the crossover of the two, which I'm grateful for. I'm very, very, very happy that I had my foot in both worlds for a bazillion reasons. You know, Do you have uh, obviously, uh, you know, digital is the future, um, mm -hmm. and with the wave plugins and all the stuff that's available now, it's almost mm -hmm. like you can get a, a CD quality output. Um, without going through, you know, a bunch of outboard gear and stuff like that. Do you have mm -hmm. a preference with the digital uh, just because of, you know, mm -hmm. X reason or Y reason? Uh, I do. Uh, yeah. I, t I typically gravitate towards this one brand of console made by a company called Digico. And, okay. um, and I do that though. I got to be honest with you. I don't do it because I love the way it sounds. It actually is incredibly neutral. Uh, you, you get to, you get to make how it sounds. Um, I did love about, you know, analog and there are now some digital offerings that kind of have a sound, you know, it's like, Ooh, I like that because it does this thing. Digico to me, at least 
you get to choose the thing. The reason I like Digico is again, on an ergonomic level, mm. on a functional level. And particularly when, as the stakes get higher, but man, I had the same mentality when it was, you know, not at the level that I'm fortunate enough to be at now. When you have to get results fast, I, I, I tell you there are months of rehearsals every day is as big as any other day. You know what I mean? You don't know who's walking in that room. And so in my mind, I have to get results immediately. Um, and Digico helps me get there quickly. It's just a fast platform. It's super well laid out. You can do everything. So, so my choice there is, is more of an ergonomic functional thing. It's when you start getting into the outboard and the plugins and all the other stuff, that's where I get, that's where the art hat really goes on. And that's when I start to, you know, use color. Yeah. Um, can you, there's in, in a career like yours, there's moments that just kind of define you as a, mm -hmm. an engineer that stand out in your, in your career to you. Mm -hmm. Um, can you tell us about one of those where it's just like, you know, Holy shit, I'm yeah. doing this. I'm doing it. Yeah. There's, there's two that always come to mind. One, was actually with Kenny Chesney, which is the only, even though I lived and worked in Nashville and that Nashville is like home number two for me. Um, he's the only country client I've ever had. And, um, and that was a, can you get on a plane tomorrow kind of thing? Nice. And, and that one, the reason I got that, which, you know, he's the biggest country artist in the world uh, or certainly one of them um, uh, came as a result of a pop connection. His man, his production manager had come to a Lady Gaga show in Las Vegas and loved what he heard. Again, you just never know who's watching. And uh, so that was a really interesting one where this guy shows up at this big pop show that I'm doing. Turns out he's a, and I knew who he was. I saw him out of the corner of my eye during the day. And I was like, is that that guy that, oh, I know who that is. That's Kenny Chesney's production manager. It's like, okay, note to self. That's who's in the room tonight among whoever else. When it was over, he came up to me. It was super nice. It was so incredibly complimentary. And I knew that it was important to have, first of all, if anyone's being complimentary to you, you should pay attention to him. But I knew have this conversation, you know, sure as shit. She hurts her hip. She breaks her hip or I can't remember what happened. The tour cancels. I'm at home for a couple of weeks. I'm sitting there like, oh God, wait, I need to work. What am I going to do? I get a call and it's them. They have decided they have their first stadium show in four days. They fire their engineer of 13 years. Wow. They need somebody tomorrow, you know? So, um, but sorry, that was a long winded sort of example of what this is all about of just, you don't, you know, you never know, know who's watching or when you're auditioning, but that Kenny Chesney gig, we played a show at the Rose bowl in Pasadena and being a big football fan and just American kid, there was a moment during that show, both of these shows that I'm going to mention are stadium shows because that is the pinnacle. I mean, that is just particularly because like I had no, my sights were not set on, I would sure I wanted to be the best mixer that I could be. I never set out to be stadium mixer guy, you know? And uh, it was just, I don't know, maybe a few songs into the Kenny show in, in the goddamn Rose bowl, you know? Yeah. And I'm just looking around at, 65,000 people and it sounds amazing and it's, it's happening. And I'm just like, and it was just simply what you said. I'm doing it. I'm doing it. The other one was in Paris with Lady Gaga and uh, similar thing. It was the beginning of one song and it just has this big signature ominous synth intro that kind of gets that feeling of like, it's happening, it's happening. And then this gigantic, larger than life beat drops and 80,000 people start moving. And I mean, I have, I have goosebumps saying it right now. I mean, it was just I'm getting that, goosebumps. Yeah. You're saying it. <laughs> so that, and that, and at that point that tour had been dialed in for so long that I pretty much just every night just have to like hit my marks and it's good. Like we're good, you know, and it sounded amazing. And it was, again, it was one of those like, Holy shit. I'm the guy doing this right now this is happening. And it's like, you know, there are those moments in life when you realize not upon reflection, but like in the moment, you're like, this is a moment. Like this is, this is happening. I will always remember this. So those two, as soon as anybody ever says it, I'm like, yes, you don't have to finish it. Let me tell you. <laughs> <laughs> so those are the two. Those are the two. 
Yeah, no, that's incredible. Well, and like Mike said, I mean, you know, you can feel the emotion in what you're saying. I mean, like, you know, I'm getting the goosebumps too hearing you talking about it because you can just mm-hmm. sort of envision those moments. And I think for a lot of people, especially music fans in general, uh, you know, music really cuts to our emotions, you know, really quickly. And so it, there's a lot of, you know, songs that I like because they remind me of a certain moment or whatever, oh, you know, totally. it doesn't have that much to do with the song. It reminds me of the moment. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and so it's, uh, it's, I guess, pretty awesome to be in a career path where basically those moments are happening all the time. You can associate something awesome with the, the, the good music anytime. Yeah. And, uh, and that's pretty, pretty incredible. That's awesome. Mm-hmm. Well, so, and to come kind of full circle in a way to what I said earlier about how, you know, I said that concerts was, it was church to me. It was very special when I was younger. And I do like in those moments, I'm realizing like kind of the, yay me or hey i worked so hard look we did it wow this is amazing but there's this other part of me that realizes that in that crowd and not just the crowds of 60 80 000, of the crowds of six or eight somebody there in that crowd is having the very best night they will ever have in their life yeah you know, it, i mean that literally you know yeah, and mm-hmm. to have something to do with that to help steer that is uh, it's an honor and it makes me it just makes me so happy to to know i can be a part of that you know yeah it's it's um, so uh, working in venues and in the music scene it's hard to keep that in mind that it's not all about you all the time it's about the people mm-hmm. in the crowd it's about the mm-hmm. people having the, the experience mm-hmm. and uh I'm, I'm glad that you pointed that out even though six or eight people instead of sixty thousand. oh yeah it, it makes it no difference on the size um you Still got to go out and do your best each time. Yeah, um, I think on that that's same, the thing, right? Being impactful to one person is as important as it is all of them. You just get to do it at scale when you're doing it for Gaga. Absolutely, yeah. right. So, so we we had the uh, the aha moments. I'm there moments, but you mm-hmm. also have the oh shit moments. Mm-hmm. And I'm sure in a you know they're not the ones you like to re- relive. But um, have you had any of the those like holy crap? I got ten seconds till this, and I don't have this or I don't have that usually you're yeah and it's this is where I struggle it's funny because you know Pooch you had on here he and I had a show about our biggest victories and our biggest mistakes and it's not it's more that I have so many of those that I struggle to figure out which ones to (laughs) cite you know what I mean Um, because I have I've I've had big gear failures right before shows I've, I've had bonehead mistakes um but, and I, you know, of course, you know, we all know that's where you learn the most. Those, those big, oh, I did it moments are just for this. Yeah. Those are for stories. The learning is the God, I fucked up. You know? <laughs> and I just have so many of them that God, I'm trying to come up with a good one for you. I mean, it's just, I don't know, something fails or, you know, there's nothing worse than that. There's something going wrong and you know what it is but there's this nothing like that sinking feeling of something's wrong and I have no idea what's happening. Those are the ones during the show where time slows down and, but it's funny, man. I'm the guy that like kind of, I'll get really upset about some little thing, but the big, big, big stuff for some reason I get very grounded and very centered and you know, I don't know why I seem to handle them well, but, um, or I think they probably take their toll after the fact is really what happens. <laughs> well, I was going to say, it's probably, you know, the luxury of things, right? When, uh, when it is just a little mistake, you have the luxury of, of exactly get frustrated with it or whatever. When it's massive and you've got to make a change quick, like yeah. you just don't have the luxury of time. You don't have time to futz with it, you know, and you're right. It probably kicks your ass later. But during the uh, in that moment, you have no choice but to just you know focus and get get down to and, business. Get it done. And that's a good. You know what? I'm going to use that. I'm going to steal that. That's great because that's exactly what it is. You know, that's why when when the and with particularly with live music, I mean, that's the whole thing. Is like it's happening now. Like the train has left the station. There's no decisions to be made. It's happening. And um, once the show's going, and um, that's the thing. Is like when when big 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 things happen, both in work and in life. I mean, you've got you just no choice but to figure it out, you know, but there are crash and burn stories. I mean, there are times when people, I knocking as loudly (laughs) as I can, there are stories of people who they do not recover and it has nothing to do with them. It's just purely like gear failure 
or something mm-hmm. like that, where just, Hey, that, that was it. Show was over, you know? So, yeah. Um, well, so speaking of, and just sort of here in the last few minutes, um, you know, and, and maybe talking about sort of these grandiose things and maybe, you know, uh, world's biggest stages, one of your, I guess, maybe near the last tour you did pre COVID may be this Bruno Mars tour. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, one of the biggest tours in the world, it was, you know, a couple years long. I mean, can you talk about just some of the, the aspects of planning for something so giant as maybe the biggest album mm-hmm. of the, you know, last five years? Yeah, totally. And that's the thing, man, is like, again, I'm jam band rock mixer guy driving down the road in Athens. And that phone call that we just spoke about, whatever, 40 minutes ago, after that phone call and after that then kind of sat for a minute and then the Beyonce thing happened, it has been a rocket ship of one after another for me. I mean, literally like I, one tour ends, Kenny Chesney ends, I go to Justin Bieber, Justin Bieber ends, I go to Lady Gaga, Lady Gaga ends, I go to, you know, you just go on down the list. And, um, and every one of those is the biggest thing happening, you know? And so it becomes, I don't know. It just kind of becomes what you do. And then now talking about having time to reflect. Now I reflect. Now I look at the scope and the size of things. I'm like, what have I been doing for the past 10 years? God, you know? And um, yeah, as far as what, it, are you saying like, what's it like to be on something like that or to prepare for? Yeah. Well, I mean, maybe it's a little bit of both. I mean, obviously, I mean, I think we've covered a lot. I mean, you, you know, a lot of the the people you've been blessed to work with are obviously, you know, astronomical successes mm-hmm. in their field. You know, they're, I mean, some of the biggest, but you know, I mean, I guess, they, you know, tours come in various shapes and sizes, you know, some bigger or some more elaborate than others. And as I understand it, I actually didn't see this tour, but um, from what I understand, it's one of the biggest maybe mm-hmm. ever. And so mm-hmm. maybe we just talk quickly, you know, here in maybe the last five minutes or so we talk just, you know, about what it was like to kind of prepare for that and then sort of how it went off. Yeah. Bruno is especially is, is a total unique case because I mentioned where, you know, who matters, who cares the most, who's there, there is nobody that cares more than that guy. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. So with a lot of camps, I'm conversing with, I'm dealing with their people air quotes, you know, and again, that those people, that those people who they are mm-hmm. might change over the course of a two year tour, you know? Um, but with Bruno, I deal with Bruno. Yeah. I mean, yes, of course he's not there all day, every day, you know, but, um, and there's plenty of people like, you know, whatever, there's a team takes a team, but like, I don't, if I have a, if I, I never wonder how I'm doing because I'm going to get a text or I'm going to get a call or I'm going to go to the dressing room and I'm going to speak to him directly. So preparing for that tour is unlike any other in that he is so insanely involved. And Bruno's work ethic is that you work tirelessly until the clock runs out. And that's his process, you know? So nonstop, relentless, tough. I'll be honest with you. Very, 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 very tough and demanding, but he's asking the same thing of himself, which makes it okay. You know what I'm saying? So just, um, yeah, just the level that you have to deal with him is what that makes that one. So uh, specific, uh, they're all super hard that hit we're getting ready for his stuff's about as hard as it gets though, just because of the demands that he places. Well, and yeah, for his, and, for, and I, uh, well, I'll go ahead. Well, I was gonna say for just real quick, also on those large scale tours, there's the tour, then there is six months to a year of promo leading up to that. So you're rehearsing, but then you're also doing all kinds of TV shows that require different sets, different arrangements. So you're preparing for this tour, but then you're also deconstructing the song and building it up for this thing you're only going to do one time. And you're just on planes, trains, and automobiles all over the place, you know, getting ready. So it's, it's a multifaceted thing. There's the tour, but then there's the promo. And honestly, the promo is the brutal part. Promo and uh, rehearsal is the brutal part. Those are the 20 hour days. Once you're on tour, you're locked and loaded. Cause you got to realize the kind of people that we're working with, you know, there, it, this is not jam band. This is the same shit every night. We are McDonald's. Like you want the <laughs> same big Mac everywhere. So you're again, just hitting your marks and you're just on autopilot once the tour gets going. 
Yeah, I guess that makes sense, you know, because once it's sort of on, it's on. And and I imagine, I mean, it seems like with Bruno Mars, I mean, I I don't think it's unexpected that his work ethic is that way and stuff. That rings true to me. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, I, I just, I, I know very little about him, but that would have been sort of one of my vibes on that guy. And, mm-hmm. uh, but I do imagine that his setup is probably, and, and maybe this is smoke and mirrors or a little bit of magic, you know, in the, in the production end, but it seems like he'd be really complicated because he's got horns, he's got, you know, guitars yeah. and bass and drums and, you know, I mean, he's got like one of everything. Yep. <laughs> and so right right like from a technical aspect you know that could be particularly challenging also and and here's yeah. the interesting thing that's actually a very astute observation and leads into i know we're running out or coming up on our time i shouldn't say running out of time um the thing about bruno is a lot of acts particularly with where there's a lot of track and there's a lot of live band the pop music is the worst for this because what happens is you've got this essentially a full album playing of track of 9 million channels of playback. And then you've got a live band and they're all on top of each other and it's flaming and it's not musical and it makes it lose impact. Bruno is a producer. He understands and he entrusts in his people. So with Bruno, it is intricate, as intricate as it gets, but it's purposeful. So those horns are never playing on top of like everything fits together perfectly you know and that's the cool thing about the bruno gig is it's done right we we uh, we we do it right and i appreciate that about that gig in fact it's one of the things that keeps me there i don't i don't like mixing it when it's a mess you know um so but, yeah, well, yeah no, it seems like a, you know it would be a little bit less fulfilling for somebody in your position to basically just be playing the track right i mean i, I think that oh that's it, garbage so basic that's there's no fun yeah fun, so. yeah yeah um so b- before we uh, close and wrap up, uh, mm-hmm. I actually would like to discuss the actual day-to-day life of someone in your position and mm-hmm. the tolls and, and the, what it takes to do what you do. And uh, being on the road as long as you are each year, being away from your family um, and and everything, is that hard? Is yes. that something? Okay. I would, and it's funny, but not for everyone. Like it's it's really it looks different for any number of people. I know people that have the strongest relationships, the strongest marriages, the strongest families, and they tour 10 months out of the year. Then I know other people who are 50 something and live out of a storage space because they're just, they also tour 10 months out of the year and they've squandered everything or they've, you know, and I, and I've, I've been on both sides of the fence, if I'm honest. Um, Kind of later in life, because see, for me, I just am such a, a student of the game. I love the whole thing. Uh, I love hate the whole thing, but ultimately, I love it. Like any good relationship, that to me, I've been always always like, I don't see, I don't understand. This is this is cool. Everything's fine. And then, kind of later in life, it was like, no, you've been doing nothing but touring forever, and everything's not fine, you know. And um, and then you kind of pick up the pieces and you, and you realign it. So it's not a cautionary tale when I immediately say yes, but it can be just be aware of what you're getting into is what I would say, you know, Um, and day to day looks any, it's impossible for me to answer that. It looks any number of ways. Sometimes it looks very charmed. Sometimes it is a torturous grind, you know, yeah, so. I imagine it's like anybody that has sort of, you know, what we might consider sort of like a prestigious job, right? Somebody who's maybe a CEO or something and doing business travel all the time. Mm-hmm. Like from the outside, it looks kind of luxurious or kind of cool. You know, you're in a new city every day, you're on planes all the time, you, you know, but yeah. for that individual, I imagine it's kind of a slog. And I think, you know, I mean, I only toured for three or four years, but in the time that I was doing it, and it was just little tours here and there, I didn't have any kids at the time. Like, it, you know, it's pretty straightforward as a young man to be able to go do that kind of thing. But um, I imagine as you age and life becomes a little more complicated, assuming you do it in sort of a, I guess, a mm. traditional way, maybe you settle down right. with somebody or you have some kids or whatever, then, um, you know, I can imagine that, you know, it's a little bit of a balancing act. You know, how do we keep everything yeah. cool at home while we're, you know, also out trying to earn our living? And, and the bigger thing, too, is if you hit a bump in the road at home, you know, you got to split. You got to go. You got to go to work. So it's then how do you then repair it? So that's when it gets yeah. really tricky. Yeah. So Yeah, um, no, no, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, yeah. So. But it's perspective. Hey, man, I could sit here and tell you some sob story about s- sitting by myself and blah, 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 blah. But then I can tell you a million. I just told you a story about sitting there with 80,000 people like that. What the 
fuck you know what i'm saying yeah. like yeah that so it's you just it's perspective it, i think that's it right the the moral is there is no right or wrong it just kind of is and uh yes. you know i mean like any experience in life we sort of grab the grab the stuff that's good and we gloss over the stuff that's bad and we try and uh, try and make the best out of the experience so uh, absolutely so that's awesome yeah. Yeah. well speaking cool. of experience thank you guys for this this was fun yeah, yeah absolutely seriously. thank been you amazing, for your Chris. time yeah, and I'm really grateful that you were able to sort of to, to work us in. This was amazing. And uh, yeah, I guess, I mean, is there, where can people learn a little bit more about you or find you online? Is there any way uh, folks can engage? <sighs> My phone number. <laughs> the, um, <laughs> you know, the normal spots, go to Facebook and look up Chris Raybold, R-A-B-O-L-D, Instagram, Chris underscore Raybold, R-A-B-O-L-D. And then myself and Kim Van Druten, uh, Pooch, we are right now you can find us on youtube if you go to pooch and raybold you can just that's all you have to search pooch and a n d r a b o l d you can find the 30 hours of content that we have up and pretty soon we've got a new endeavor coming up and i'm gonna i'm gonna wait on that one. okay <laughs> yeah right. well yeah. cool well thanks so much chris once again i mean this has been an awesome conversation and uh, it's so cool to hear about sort of this life on the road both mike and i are sort of nerds in and around the con uh, concert realm and big music fans also and you know have dabbled at least you know a couple toes in the in the industry and so uh, it's always fun to hear about it from somebody who's sort of made a career out of it i love it i love it yep thanks for having me so cool. no well, and, yeah and thanks to everybody who tunes in this week and every week and uh, we'll see you all next time <laughs>